On this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast, I'm joined once again by Jason, who is, in my view, the biggest ranking flanker in our Discord community. That's right, he loves these big blocks of troops so much that he even knocked down a wall to accommodate them. So I thought it'd be great to get him back on the show to chat about painting big armies as well as actually getting round to having a game with them. Sound good? Right, let's hop to it. Sorry, I'm, I'm watching a lot of Peter Rabbit at the moment. What well, hobby have you been doing then, Matthew? I've, I've said a couple of things on Discord that you've done. Some nice little bit of nerdlings came along, didn't it? And then you started doing some more Rangers of Shadow Deep playing. Yeah, so at the moment I'm a... Uh... I'm getting back to six mil. I feel like I've been saying that for months and months, but I am literally uh, been painting last night my wee six mil guys because last episode I had Brent Spivion. I don't know if you've heard that one yet, but the, the game Mayhem. I want to... I've got it on my list to listen to, but I've been um, avoiding things that are of a different scale to mine because I can't admit to myself that I was wrong on 28. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aye, so I'm I'm uh, I'm working on those the the, the six mil, and then uh, I've got I've got a couple of Nargo guys to go back to. I've got that Lord on the horse, and then yeah. I've got um, the wee bases with the Nordglins and the mushrooms and that that I did. So I like uh, those mushrooms. Aye, they were uh, they were an Etsy three D print job. So uh, I can't. How are you finding them. the resins? I don't know much about them, but like the um. They seem fine to me. They seem totally fine. Like for my, I'm not that I'm putting them through their paces or that. I did a, I did actually like on the six mil front. I got, I needed some extra guys, and I got a. Somebody was doing like three D print. I think they were ten mil, and I think was it Warmaster was the Warhammer game, but scaled down, and yeah, uh, yeah, they're, they're doing these miniatures. This this person, so I got these these dark elves. And uh, they're six mil, and uh, he sent them out to me, and I opened yeah. the packet and he put like a wee bonus miniature in it. it seemed like a wee command unit or something, but tiny, and uh, it fell on the floor. And as I as I kind of moved to get it, like it, it, the odds of this happening were almost none. I stood right on it and it broke. So it it been out the packet like less than six seconds and it was broke and it's so tiny you can't even fix it so uh it was a bit you know, I, it was a bit sad i was once told i was told just last week by a psychologist that i'm working for um that there was this exper- experiments done on these people that have um on a bigger divide between their unconscious mind and their conscious mind and things like this so there's these people going to look for what clothes they're going to wear that day they're in the wardrobe having a look and they'll pick up a dress with their right hand and without them knowing, their left hand will put it back. So you know, it's like no, the left hand, the left side of the brain doesn't like that. It just puts it back, and they don't know what's happened. They all of a sudden they're not carrying that dress they've just chosen. I reckon your unconscious mind went, "No, we can't be having that miniature. That's yeah. just not happening." <laughs> Threw it down. Long, it was a rather long anecdote, but <laughs> no, makes sense. I, my, my, it was like one tiny six mil miniature too many, and uh, we had yeah, to get rid absolutely. of it. So, um, yeah. but yeah, 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 you're you're certainly not a six mil guy, are you? Big old armies, big huge tables, having to knock walls down to accommodate them. So, how's that all going for oh, you? Oh no, the, the the walls knocking down was because we improved the house, of course. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely. A, had nothing to do with the miniatures. Improved your points value at your house. That goes into the home report when you're. Uh, you know, when I was you're... really upset because only last week, uh, no, sorry, last month. Um, that we were told, oh, you know, you probably devalued your home by doing this. No, 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 yeah, you don't understand. <laughs> in a certain community, this has improved the value. <laughs> yeah, in the home report, it literally says, like, you, you could fit a six by four table in this room. That puts, like, 10 grand on the house, so. Yeah. <laughs> Good. But, um, no, I mean, 28 millimeter is clearly the godly size. It is favoured by all denominations of the church, and that's the way we should go forward. Um, everything else is wrong. I mean, I can't possibly admit that I should have gone 15 mil because I'd, <laughs> pro- I'd probably um, end it all now. Yeah. Um, well, you can't go but, back now, can you? It's, uh... Oh, God, no. And I should have gone 15 mil, but that's with experience. Um, but 28 mil is what, you know, when you're 10 years in and you're God knows how many thousands of pounds, you just, it's like an old-fashioned wedding. You just can't get out of it. 
you, it's just not worth it. You just, you're, just, you're just there, aren't you? For the, for the next 50 years, that's where you're at. And you're going to make it work. <laughs> yeah. But what the, that's the thing. What's the rush? Yeah. It's not like it's, it's not. Um, I, read a, I read a good uh, article. I get the miniature War Games magazine now. And Conrad Kinch, that was on the podcast a few episodes ago, had wrote a good piece on, like, he did a, did a wee experiment with painting minimum of 20 minutes a day and all this and it was pretty good but one of the things he'd said was like this isn't a job it's a hobby so like you know you don't get some done one day or one week like it's a hobby it's not it's not like somebody's paying you chatting your door down and you need to have it done like just enjoy it i i i yeah no that's not how i say it <laughs> it is a Sorry. job for you <laughs> well no it's i've got i, I have goals in my head and I think that's what I want to do. If I do it in any other way than some kind of discipline, it will not happen because other things take priority. And I know that these are hobbies and these aren't really your main life priorities. But if you, like, say, whatever your endeavor is, if it's like, oh, I wish I could get in shape or I wish I could make this thing, unless you specifically put time aside and specifically give some kind of discipline to it, it just doesn't happen. Um, in my life, and so that's the way I see this thing. I can't imagine even just Dungeon Saga, just finishing that one box of minis, unless I put, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it in this manner. The deadline doesn't have to be there, but the discipline and the and the working towards it needs to be. Otherwise, it simply doesn't occur, let alone on the scale that I'm doing, stupid 10,000-point armies. When, <laughs> if you do that ad hoc, you're never going to get anywhere. When you say, like, if you don't have the discipline and the system in place, other things will take priority, do you mean other hobby stuff? Do you mean you'll just go off and paint other stuff? Or do, do you mean, like, you'll, I don't know, pick up a guitar or a golf club or something? Yeah, I'll pick up a guitar and burn it. I'm no good at music. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, it's mostly perhaps a sign of my type of lifestyle because I'm running my own business. I've got a family as well, like most people, but... I could easily have business take up all my time until 10 p.m. if I don't shut it off at 8. Um, similarly, I won't have family time because of the business unless I go, no, everything shuts off for this hour in the morning and this hour in the evening. So it's partially my lifestyle. But it's also that I think, like most hobbyists, there's a bit of a butterfly thing going on in my mind. It's, and, um, you know, it's like, oh, uh, Judge Dreadman has just come along. And, oh, everything is now dropped, and I'm now looking at this thing, and there's, there's paints and God knows what scattered across the floor that I'm no longer looking at because I'm not going to look at Judge Dredd. Well, no, I need to be able to shun that to just finish something rather than have dozens of semi-finished things, and I'm butterflying off to the next thing. Um, I got very fed up with that because I did that throughout teens. I don't know if you've had a moment of it that you don't – complete something that you would have liked to and then you've already moved on to whatever and then you've got half completed projects behind you mm -hmm. what have i what have i done where am i i haven't got anything finished <laughs> i haven't got anything um but that, that's that's what i've been finding so what's so, your what's your process then like you, you want to build a massive army that's what you're doing where do yeah. you start with that um you know what's the What's the what's the process and the steps and and things like that? What, with the idea of the decisions, I mean, yeah. I don't think that would take. I think that would take a team of ex-Soviet scientists and unscrupulous <laughs> methods to find that out. But it's, it's, something hits your mind, you know. It's like you just, for whatever reason, you just go. Oh, I'm not. I'm not into blondes. I'm into redheads, and that's just what's happening. I can't tell you why. Just go away. I'm, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and Urukai just came to my head and I went, "Why? Why are they on rounds? That's disgusting." We're putting them on squares and they're going in blocks. Okay, oh, that, that looks lovely. No, don't, listen, that's not a big enough army. I want an army. I want the Helm's Deep. I also want to play Warhammer and I want to play Lord of the Rings, War of the Ring, and I want to play the skirmish version. And I want to play Frostgrave and I want to play this. How can I make that fit everything? Here we go. Here we go. That's what's happening. Oh, no, that 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 pike block looks lonely. It needs another one. And so <laughs> you end up just going, all right, this. Let's bookmark this. What kind of things am I liking of this? And then you sort of, in my head, I sort of go, this sort of scale looks good. This covers these five games. Um, my effort is not going to have to be doubled when I go to a different game system because I don't have to make another army. I can use this army. And so it's that 
discipline and focus to go, this is what I want to achieve. These are the games I want to play. These are the style of games I've been enjoying so far. So any new games that may come up in that style can be covered by X that I've already done. And I'm finding that I'm, not only am I playing more games, but I'm playing more games that are fully painted. And my effort goes a lot further than it ever has done in terms of just um, just achievement. Um, and that that's quite a loose, free-thinking process. It's like a multidisciplinary um, sort of – you're drawing from so many lines to bring this rough picture together. But that's roughly where I go. It's quite free associative, I suppose, isn't it, that way of thinking. But it's, 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 it's got an aim to it. It's got a goal. So you can be a bit loose, but it's the, 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 the discipline mostly comes in in two ways. One is you need to bookmark what you're not going to touch. So you need to say, I, I am not deviating from this. And the other one is every day I do something, five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, whatever. Every day, five minutes. That's what it is. And that's that's the only disciplinary element, and that's the – only sort of process there is. So the end goal, obviously, is to have this massive army painted up. How does that look like broken down? Like, do you have, do you look at it on months or quarters or like, is, do you go that granular with it? Or is it just a case of X amount of time per day? The goal is actually wider than that. Um, the, go the, the goal was to help me, um, this might be oversharing, but I'll go with it helped me become a bit more um, extroverted in my ability to reach out to people and create, um, like, just just bonds with people through my hobby because it's something I've always kept very sort of in the background. You don't tell people about it. You know, <laughs> God, no, just put that box over there. But now how can I reach out to people and make bonds with new people with this? It takes a bit of a confidence that I've never really had. So there's that which means, okay, I need to invite people into my world because most of my friends and associates don't do this hobby. Um, so, okay, I need to invite them in. What's the best way of inviting them in? Well, you need to introduce them to a small game, stuff like that, and then try and build them up into doing big games. Now, if I'm doing big games, not only do I need to have one army, but I need to have two, and I need to have a full table, and I need to have them all painted and everything else, so that I can then invite people in. They've had a bit of a gentle build-up to this, if they're interested. You haven't forced them. It forms a means of me connecting with people through my hobby in a way that pushes my um, boundaries in actually just interacting with people. And they don't have to do anything. That's the key thing. They don't have to do a thing. They can just turn up, have a few drinks, have some food, have a bit of banter, and they can have a game with me, and I get to have my big game. So actually, the one army is only... A third of the way there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> what are your two armies? So I've got the uruk as you know, and the Goblins, and the other one is a mixture of Empire and Lord of the Rings, Elves and Numenorians, predominantly human Empire warhammer type thing. Why those two armies then? Same reason I like Redheads. Can't be explained, it's just a gut. <laughs> yeah. it, tick it tickles Mr. Stockwell's fancy in some <laughs> strange way. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I've always been attracted to fantasy in general, and more so than sci-fi. When I'm in sci-fi, I'm not into the big, epic army clashing and stuff like that. I like the small, intricate, skirmishy things. I don't know why. It's just what it is. And and sometimes it's nice enough just to go, I don't know, I, it's just what it is. <laughs> um, but the... I, I just quite like them, and they're quite they're generic enough that they they always cross over. Because from what I understand, the Lord of the Rings is a genre beginning book. You know, it really did kick everything off in that vein. And without Lord of the Rings, I think Rick Priestley's on. Um, yeah, it was Rick Priestley. He, he was saying he's on record as saying that without Lord of the Rings, there would be no Warhammer. Mm -hmm. without, without any Lord of the Rings, there probably wouldn't be a, a huge other plethora of that kind of fantasy, um, which means it's generic enough that I can cross over to loads of other stuff, and it's just always tickled my fancy in many ways 
because of that as much as anything else. Do you think that makes sense, or have I dribbled? No, no. Dri- uh, my dribbling on the floor at this point. We're, we're all guilty of dribbling in this hobby, whether it's paint or whether it's, you know, something else. But uh, you made a comment uh, not so long ago, not so long ago, I should say, about uh, how you you'd bought, like you took a bit of time and thought about a purchase you'd made. Uh, I think it was a tank you said you'd got, or a couple of tanks. So you, yeah. You'd had a good old think about it, and and you seem to be saying that um, you're looking at like a quality over quantity approach now, and things that you're actually buying. Is that right? Because of my motivation, yeah. Mm. Because such a big project, motivation is. I found it to be hard to keep. Like, um, the, there was a, a cabinet maker that I really like called James Cronoff, and he said, "Guard your enthusiasm as you would guard your life." Because you need that enthusiasm to drive you forward, to have the will to do some of these things that are hard. And I'm not going to deny that this big army is hard. Um, It's a grind at times. I nearly burnt all of the goblins. Um, And I do mean burnt. I had the petrol (laughs) in my head. Well, deliberately, I I was thinking it was some sort of weird paint technique that had went wrong. But no, you you mean... uh... Uh, You could call it a paint technique because then the paint job goes away. Yeah, <laughs> I like a pile of dead goblins. That could be a feature on the table. Um, but, but when you when you're at your two hundredth goblin, it's like, my God, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? What have you become? What is this, Jason? You could have done three doctorates in this time period. What? Why have you done this? Yeah. So that I have to get. I have to buy things that I absolutely adore, and that way my motivation and willpower continue further than they would do otherwise. Compromise is no good. Anything I've ever compromised on, I've ended up putting in a box for years or selling. Do you think, like, you know, we, we, we do hear stories like this of people painting up armies and, and hating it, uh, you know, getting through it. We hear terms like that, just getting through it, grinding through it. It's a funny thing because it's a hobby. Do, do you think that's just... Do you think people are... I don't know what I'm. I'm trying to say. Do you, do you think a hobby should have a really difficult part? Do you think the reward comes from that? Because at the end of it, you've achieved something. You've, you know, it's not all been plain sailing. If that makes any sense whatsoever. I've I've always found anything that doesn't have some kind of, well, your term, grind to it, something that I have to work at, hasn't been very fulfilling at the end. Hmm. And maybe that's just my uber male compatriots banging that into me over the years, or what have you, or, you know, discipline, 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 the growing. If, if there's no challenge, it feels so frivolous and so waste of time unless there's some kind of element of pro- progress in it for me. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy certain aspects of painting, just not the scale, but that's, but that's incidental because the greater goal is so enjoyable that it's worth it because I've had a couple of big games. And the satisfaction and the joy, from my point of view, has, has been enormous. Mm-hmm. And it's really fun when you introduce people to a game and they've ended up going, that was really good. You know, like surprised. They've said, that was really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've got no interest in doing miniatures themselves, but they just said, I really enjoyed the day and they're coming back. Yeah, they're, they're never gonna they're never gonna do miniatures or paint them, but they just love to having a game with us. Um, so that trumps the discipline element of it. Yeah, it's like again, like if we look at video games, like a game like Skyrim, which I loved, absolutely loved. But my sister loves it. Yeah, you put that on, and it's all there for you. It's all laid out there. It's done, you know, and it's it's very enjoyable to play. But the minute you put it off, you don't feel satisfaction you you don't feel like there's been a reward anywhere on the contrary i think after a big video game session you don't feel great about yourself but with this you know from the moment you're cleaning the flash off a miniature to to priming it to going through the painting process to varnishing it to getting a rule book studying the rules uh, building terrain putting a table together there's all these things that you're doing the game is actually a tiny percentage of that but after you've done all that I think that's why it's so rewarding because you look back on it and think that was all 
you know, done by my hand with other folks, of course, but um, you look back at what's been achieved there compared to, you know, anyone could just bang on a computer game and it's all just there for you. Uh, you know, you play through it, you put it off. So what? And, and yet it doesn't exist with books, does it? Because the books, it's all been laid out for you. Mm. The story is all there. You're not having to imagine anything. But the act of reading doesn't leave you, leave anyone that I know feeling that way either. There is something about visual media that's different um, that's not as fulfilling for some reason for most people because mm. we're, all, we're all very practical animals at heart even if we've lost it in the modern age there is something at root that you pick something up and do something your physiology is entirely with you in that act mm. and that's why I'm a carpenter that's why I'm a cabinet maker and, and, and anyone that retires ends up doing some kind of tinkering and um, because they th there's something base about it for humans and for men specifically as well to do something hard um uh it's, most men obviously go more to the physicality end don't they but um but nonetheless it's it's definitely core for us as humans and i've given up getting video games probably 10 years ago Mm -hmm. because for exactly that reason but, it's all, but not just for that reason because I found it such a time sink all those things I would like to have done but, you know, everyone says it to themselves and they, oh I'd like to do that, I'd like to do this, I'd like to achieve that you play a video game for 10 minutes and it's 6 hours later yeah, uh, it's frightening and what's happened there? I haven't spoken to anyone I haven't gone and met anyone, I haven't done anything social I haven't achieved anything and it's not good, I don't feel good at the end, like you say, so I, I completely get it um, but it's quite a bit amorphous, though, isn't it? Because it's such a base impulse in humans to do things. And we're not, like you, your job now, isn't it? You're, you're not physically doing anything anymore. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's normal to not physically do things anymore. And it's quite, I think people miss it, miss, miss out on it. So I completely get what you're saying, even in my weird gam rambling way. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it, and I mean, not to get too much into the woods, but uh, into the weeds, sorry, um, we could go in the woods if you want, but going into the weeds, uh, during the pandemic, we were we had all this shoved down our throat with like digital this, digital that, you know, people who ran events, they did digital events and we had this horrible Crap. like, uh, let's have uh, Friday drinks, you know, virtual pub, you know, all this shite and it was, I know what folks were doing, you know, people were trying to get through in the best they could, but it's no substitute for the real world and it never could have been, you know, physical, tangible things. No, I, I told my mates that I'm going to see you in a year. Mm -hmm. That's just what I said. Yeah. I said the family. And um, I live in a little hamlet in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, so my mother-in-law tells me it's the middle of nowhere. Um, I, I always thought it was somewhere. But it's um, it's so isolated that a few, a few of the neighbours and us, we just – quietly broke the law and we just said we're going to hang out with each other because yeah. what's the difference between isolating our house and isolating in our little hamlet with yeah. the nearest person two miles down the road for god's sake Aye. um so we just hung out directly with each other so that we had the physical there's something very different about being in front of someone mm -hmm. in, in a real sense yeah um i can't tell you what it is not intelligent enough to know but i'm yeah i'm completely with it it just doesn't work because I, mm. I had lots of opportunities to play games on like tabletop simulator, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I mean it looks cool, but I I just yeah. I wasn't interested in spending any more time at the computer. Just wasn't interested. No, no, couldn't be doing it. I mean, I, no, definitely not. I I I I'd always favour the physical experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if I can. Um, saying that with a podcast on a Discord channel. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing, you know, you dip in and out of these things, they don't take a lot of time, and, and again, podcasts, you know, if you're listening to a podcast, you could be painting, you could be working on something else, you could be whatever. Yeah, and our hobby's niche enough that you do need to widen the net in any way you can, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and technology does allow that, because it is odd how niche our hobby is, I don't know why it's so niche. I've introduced no end of people to gaming now, I mean, it must be nearly 30 people in my immediate vicinity. Only one of them has bought any miniatures mm -hmm. to paint, and that might be say, saying more about my selling techniques. And but, you know, <laughs> but most of them are still playing, mm -hmm. so the games is not an issue. 
people love the socializing people love having a game people love doing something tactile in a game board games are tactile aren't they that physicality again that, that presence um but the actual hobby itself and nerding out as much as i love to nerd out about it that's just not for them and so you have to widen the net and i love discord and this for that because we're all clearly need, wanting to scratch that itch and the immediate people around us are just they're going no <laughs> No, I'm not deep diving into this with you. Why am I painting 70 goblins? I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Uh, I mind you saying before that you, you almost saw your Warhammer hobby, as, as we sometimes call it, as like three separate hobbies, like collecting, painting, gaming. Do you still look at it that way? Definitely, yeah. yeah. There's probably even more hobbies on the side of it. Because mm-hmm. um, it's... There's, there's, there's that technology element now, isn't there? Because it's 3D printing. Um, so people love their gadgetry with that. And, yeah, there's so many subsets and subgenres within it. Yeah, um, like, I mean, even doing this podcast is a wing of it, you know? Um, absolutely, yeah. It's just another thing that I do that's part of it. Uh, you know, especially when Robert and I play games and, uh, you know, we could do a little audio battle report as well. And uh, it's just another wee wing to it that makes it even more enjoyable, I reckon. There's not many hobbies that can be as broad as that, is there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not many at all. Um, But, yeah, but for some reason it's not generically accepted as as, as football is as as ubiquitous, isn't it? And sports in general. Mm-hmm. The, I, I wouldn't describe our hobby as ubiquitous, for, you know, for everyone. Yeah. Um, it, I don't know if it's – I might just be speaking for myself, but it does seem to be that in every village there's one. <laughs> That's it. And you've got to go to the next village to find that one that will join you. Um, but most people are willing to game, without a doubt. It's just they're not willing to do the other subsets, mm-hmm. I've found. Um, Swinging back round to your – your army then like what uh, oh what yes the army that's what we were talking about yeah what sort of stages have you went through so far where we're putting it together and painting it up and and what's sort of next for you every stage i always try to make it that it's a, an army that i can play at x level of points or whatever it is and then i can uh play a game to keep my motivation up so i'm not waiting until it's ten thousand. So every section of stuff that I'm painting, it's all, that's another 1,000 points, or that's 1,500 points extra. And each one can be played on its own. If I just want to get used to it in a 1,500-point game to get used to that particular wing of the army. Um, so I just sort of break it down like that a little bit. And so right now, I'm working on um, an elite empire army of 1,200 points to add on to my already existing empire. So that if I get the opportunity to play a bigger game with some mates or some people that might want to come around and play, I can put on my 4,000 points that I've got so far. They can bring whatever they've got if they've got stuff, and we can make it work against the Orcs. Um, Or if I've only got an evening, I can then play with just those elites, and that 1,200 points just to get used to that bit. And that way it all compartmentalizes, and I can squeeze it into the time I've got or or the opportunity of players. It's quite an endeavour, actually, putting on a big game. My God, it's a lot of setup. Yeah, and then taken down as well. Like if you have to, if you have to clean up that day, you know, because the I don't know the table needs used for breakfast or dinner or whatever. It's a. Uh... Well, with the big games, I push the the dinner table into the corner and fold down one wing, and then the kids are just tucked into the corner and away, wondering if they can join in. <laughs> but no, they can't. Um, but the the big table that I set up is all flat pack and it takes three and a half hours to set it up for a 6,000 point game and three hours to pack it away. That's obsession, isn't it? It's a big <laughs> chunk of a day, like if you're working on top of that as well. So well, you, we always take, take a, day a off half day or I take a day off, half day. Well, I get up 5am, start setting the thing up and it's ready for 9am, 9, 9 without a doubt. Um, we play through until... 2, 3 a.m. the following day. <laughs> um, uh, and, and then I pack up either the following morning or I pack up until 5 a.m. 
because I'm not I'm not bothered about not having sleep for 36 40 hours um bothers me but that yeah I so I if I bother because my mate um likes his sleep as well so he always does the prep the night before plays it bookmarks the end of the evening saying look 10 o'clock is the end I can't go further and then he packs away the following day and his missus is fine with that I try to limit the disruption in the household a bit but um yeah it's a big endeavor and it, and if you invite people along, it's actually quite a big responsibility to try and make sure they're having fun and they're not just coming along to this weird little cave of wonders of um, strange people geeking out. And <laughs> You could do both. <laughs> I, I've tried, but the smell changes, I find. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a BO uptake. Here's a... Like, you're touching on it here that um, it's something that's been on my mind when I've been playing that how do we balance like just switching off and enjoying the game with watching the clock? Cause like, I think almost everyone who listens is, has got a family. Um, you know, a lot of folks were like young families as well. So that's ultimately your priority and, and you need to be there as well. So you've got this finite time to play. And I've always found that, you know, we've got like a hard stop or whatever, two, three, mine's is in the afternoon rather than in the morning. But, um, right. you know, we're, we're playing the game, but I'm, I've always got one eye on the clock and I'm always, well, not always, I'm sometimes kind of hurrying us along. And I, I don't really like that because I want to just relax and enjoy it. But at the same time, I know that we need to, we need to get things wrapped up eventually. So uh, I would love to just have a game at some point where, I don't know, the time has stopped and you could just play and not worry about it, but. I mean, do you get that with your, with your huge games that you play? I mean, it's it's just the reality of life. Um, I, at, at this stage, there are commitments, there are boundaries, there are other things that we have to do. And this is getting squeezed into the gaps. And so you just got to say to yourself, what do I want to do with today? What is it I want to do? Um, because I can't just be free form, because otherwise the game, A, might not even start until 2 p.m., because we're all chatting and having nonsense and looking at each other's miniatures and just being, you know, whatever. There's got, and then the game will go on for three days, which mm. is fine if I'm retired uh, and I don't have to give the, the room back to my kids and stuff. But it's just, just life. So work with it. Okay, I'd like to have um, at least four turns and have this objective and this objective so that. This objective can be achieved within three turns potentially and this objective can be achieved within six turns so that we always have something that we've achieved and we always have something that we can play to. Um, with a big game, the more people, the more that can get done and the easier you can be about speeding things along. Because say there's six players, great, brilliant. I mean, you're, you're dividing the work by three. So you can all chill a bit more. If only three of you turn up, and you've got a ten thousand point game that you want to batter through. All right, you've got you've got a disciplined day, evening, and night ahead of you. <laughs> and that's you got to decide whether that's what you want to do. Um, for us, big games are entertaining enough that we don't mind it being a touch of work. They're an interesting intellectual exercise. They're an interesting um, visual spectacle. They're fun, and, and it's just a very different day to have spent compared to the normal days. It's just something that stays in your mind. So it's okay to have that impetus behind it in order to achieve it. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I don't have much of a problem with it myself because in every other aspect of life, it's the same. I've got a sports day today. I'm like, oh, I've got a football match. Okay, we, there's boundaries to those things. There's things you need to achieve. There's things you need to get back for. Um, if you're a high anxiety person, you're going to be looking at the clock or whatever anyway or looking at the door in case someone breaks in. So, you know, there's always going to be that individual element, but... Until we're retired, man, I can't see it changing, so I don't see any problem with it. It's just, again, it's that thing of, okay, what do I want to achieve here? I want to have fun in this manner because I know I have fun in that manner, so let's put a few posts in the ground here, here, and here to give us, okay, if we don't manage to get that far, at least we've got this far and we've all had a good time. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's how I approach it, which, again, is more like a job in a way, but it's the only way it happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're playing Warhammer as well, aren't you? Like, literally playing Warhammer. 
At the always... moment, at the moment, the newbies, I'm still working them through um, a mixture of uh, Dungeon Saga and Frostgrave. A couple of them are being promoted up to a bit wider format skirmish games because they're just not ready for these large Warhammer games. It would be too intimidating. They wouldn't enjoy themselves. And frankly, Warhammer doesn't sell that easily to new players at all. I mean, my wife hated it. My sister hated it. And they both loved Dungeon Saga, and they both really enjoyed Frostgrave and, to some element, Lord of the Rings. And the other 20 people as well, they're all in various stages of these things that I've just talked about. And they all enjoy the games. But Warhammer turns them off straight away. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm playing Warhammer with the two people that also know Warhammer and are obsessed with Warhammer. But I'm building up this cadre of people, this uh, cadre of insanity that can come with me and will probably progress through Lord of the Rings skirmish game and then into War of the Ring, which is only one step on from the Lord of the Rings skirmish game rules, which is simple enough. And it means that people aren't intimidated and feeling like it's um, – too niche because it's a widely known IP as well as being a simple enough rule set that I can then bring them through. So the only reason I'm playing Warhammer at the minute is because that's the only way I can play mass games because that's the two blokes that play Warhammer and I play Warhammer and stuff. But it's not good for new players, I have found. Mm -hmm. So we'll be playing something different eventually. I've been playing around with Kings of War because um, that's quite a simple rule set as well. I mean, it plays quicker as well, so it might be good. It might not be a 5 a.m. finish. It might be a 10 p.m. Mm. On like Warhammer and Kings of War and stuff like that, especially with these massive games, do, do you find it's a problem when it's somebody's turn and everyone else is just watching? Or does that, are you got a, a workflow, if you like? That's not really the word for it, but... I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah how, how does it go? It's a problem for newbies. And it's a problem for people that aren't gamers. And so it's the casual players, I would say. Mm. It's a problem for them without that. For people that are in, in in the house of insanity with us, they're they're as obsessed as as I am, whether it's my turn or not. Because I'm watching what they're doing, I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing. I'm enjoying the models. I'm enjoying this. It's just not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I don't know how it's been for you when when you've ever played something that's an I go you go. Are you particularly bored when it's not your go? Not me, no, because I I love set the game up. So I'm I'm trying to be engaged rather than uh, you know going and looking out the window or whatever so but I, yeah, I so could, you sound like you like me then i could imagine it i could imagine like if i was trying to get folk to play it, i'd be conscious of it when it was my turn i'd imagine i would be quite almost hurried because i wouldn't want them having to stand about too long and lose interest i think that'd be on my mind a wee bit my experience has been that you're right to worry about it for casual gamers, that they don't like it. Um, so the the alternate activation thing is a great thing. The um, interrupts that you can get with some gaming systems is great, and a faster gameplay is essential mm. um, for casual gamers. Um, so I, when when I get more of my casuals into the game, we won't be playing Warhammer. We'll be playing something else. Mm -hmm. Still be using the miniatures and the terrain, but it, it'll be um, something else without them. I'd heard that a while back of like folk doing Kings of War with chess clocks and that, which seemed a bit weird at the time, but looking back, I'm like, well, I, I could see why they did it. <laughs> Some people like that time element, don't they? It mm. creates a different dynamic to the decision-making. Some people are useless at decision under pressure, so it really, it really flies them out of the window. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I don't like the chess clock myself. Um, for a really big game because it's just too much to get done mm -hmm. um, to put that time element on it. But on a skirmish game, I can imagine it adding something. Like the Dungeon Saga, I quite like... Um, we've re recently tried out that when you break down a door um, to um, go to the next level, that instead of breaking it down physically as the game um, dictates, that you have something a bit more of a D&D &D element that's, uh, okay, time stops, there's a riddle, painted on the door in magic letters and you've got to solve this riddle to get through the door or you'll lose one health point and you turn over a sand timer solve the riddle in this 30 seconds um that's that's fun i like that that's a bit more sort of game showish and, the, and the, my, my mates like that element mm -hmm. but when there's a big game and you've got literally 400 models to move no 
to give people the breath, breathing space for God's sake. Yeah, I could imagine. I could imagine some folks are pretty mad and playing it, you know, properly overthinking everything, measuring stuff out in advance, humming and hawing about it. I could, I could imagine you. Not saying you would experience this with anyone you've played with, but just in the hobby in general, there'll be a few folk like that that I bet are almost impossible to play against. Yeah, they're not invited back, unfortunately, <laughs> because they, Cause they don't enjoy themselves. <laughs> yeah, and they some of them end up crying in a ball in a corner, wondering what they've done with their life, and it's <laughs> it's okay. Um, but no, you've got to be careful who you invite. Um, not just from a are they a a whole of a person or not? You know, are they a power gamer? Uh, turn two, I've won. All right, we'll go away. You're never playing again. Thank you for the game. I don't know what you were playing, but we weren't playing anything, were we? Um, but no, you, you've got to be careful on many fronts who you invite to that kind of game. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a bit of responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> in a way, I know there's a lot goes in it. It's it's not just getting uh, the snakes and ladders out, opening the box, putting the board out. Like there's there's a lot more to it. There's months or years of preparation sometimes for games. Uh, I'm but, two and a half years prep now. Yeah. And I'm still not finished. I think I'm going to top it at four years mm-hmm. when I've achieved this goal. Yeah. That's, 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 I could have done a doctorate. <laughs> yeah, but where's the satisfaction in that, you know? Uh, whereas if you none, none, <laughs> putting a couple of big armies together, uh, but that's it. You know, like you're saying, it's not you're not waiting on those armies to be quote unquote finished because you, you you've got the armies. You're just building them up like with a unit. Then so if you've got a do, do you do you try and get your full unit finished for painting consistency or, or or will you bulk up a unit later on? So say you've got like twenty soldiers in it. Could you further down the line bump that up to 40 and so on and so forth? Or would you like to paint them all at the same time just so they all look similar? It's more about the time constraints. So because I'm doing so many, it's about what is the most efficient way of doing this army knowing that my goal is X. Well, that means making all 60 of your halberdiers in one go, mm-hmm. under undercoating them um, all in one go is the most efficient way. And then you paint them as an entire unit in one go. So not all 60, because they'd be broken into three units of 20 in this particular example, or two units of 30, whatever it is. But no, I've made all of them in one go, primed them all in one go, that divided them into their units, and then I get one unit out and I put the rest away because it becomes a, a mental intimidation to see 500 unpainted miniatures. It really puts me off. So I, I put them away. But I'm painting all 30 in one go. One colour, one colour, one colour, one colour this evening, then then I've got white for the next evening, then I've got brown for the following evening, and that's just what I'm doing. And I've got Teleon in the background, I'm chatting to my missus at the same time. This is all dead space um, tasks, you know, those dead zones that you could be doing something whilst you're chatting and visually, you know, whatever else. And and that's the most efficient way to get through it. If you'll be languishing on this thing, I mean, just, just a 15% difference in time is months um, on this scale of project. So you, you can't be doing it that way. The, the the sort of hiding of miniatures is, I swear by that, you know, um, the stuff oh, that... Oh, yeah. The stuff that you've got to paint still, putting that out of your, um, your eye on your day-to-day and when you're painting it, I think it's cognitively very important because it's it, I liken it to... Like homework, and again, going back to the the pandemic, I don't know why I'm obsessed with the pandemic today. I, I hated it. Uh, but it's because like, you're coughing. <laughs> it probably is that, probably is that. But like homework, and so a lot of people did homework and through the pandemic, and that was, it's it seemed to be good initially because, you know, there's, there's certain pros, no commutes and get out of your bed a bit earlier and stuff like that. But see, working in your house, the cognitive cost of even going to the toilet where like, you see the washing basket, you see this and that, you, you see <laughs> things that need done. And your brain like is taking note of all this stuff. So like, you, and if you liken it to your, your uh, to-do list, your, your to, to paint pile, if you like, if you've just got that all out, your brain's 
thinking, you know, this all needs done. Whereas if you've just got the stuff you're working on in front of you, I think it's um, it, it seems a lot more straightforward, if that makes sense. Probably a long-winded <laughs> metaphor, but... No, no, it's, it's, it's one that most people understand. Mine comes directly from construction. When you're building a house or doing over a, a stately home, which I do quite commonly, the sheer vastness of the task is very much a stressor and a weight, and it will put, it puts most people off. It becomes so boggling. Mm-hmm. So you compartmentalize things, and you break it down, and you only concentrate on this one aspect, and you keep the holistic in mind every now and again. So you can go and dip into the overall picture to figure out where you are and where you're going next. But then you put that overall picture away and you get every um, indicator of that overall picture away because you're eating the elephant. You need to, you need to only eat that one toe now. And, and so you concentrate on, I'm only doing the windows on this house. So that's all we're going to look at. And it's exactly the same for any big project. You need to compartmentalize it and break it down. So I'm completely with you because it, people aren't built for it. It's so much of a stressor. And in your particular example, people were going insane because they were at home and not socializing. So, of course, it was obsessing over the washing is still there, the washing is still there, the washing is still there. Ah! <laughs> oh, my God. Talking about, like, you, you know, the, the big house example in your work, do you think that um, managing big projects like that in your professional life have helped you to, to do these projects in your hobby life? Never thought of it. It must have done. I, I can't imagine that it hasn't influenced me. It, it's, in fact, it must have done because I've it, this this sort of this sort of progression in the hobby life has only occurred since I started developing those skill sets in the professional life. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was all free form before that and didn't get anywhere. So yes, I'd say it must have done. I think it's quite cool. You know, again, a lot of us, yourself and myself, we come back into hobby and adult life and we've all, you know, done jobs, we've learned trades, whatever. We're, we're coming back into hobby with new skill sets, with new perspectives. And I find that quite interesting, you know, where that might lead the hobby. If we throw a blanket over Games Workshop and all that, they'll do their own thing. But, you know, in our corner of the hobby... How might that progress? Because you're always getting folks coming back and they've got these skill sets and they've got these experiences and ideas. And I'm interested in where that could take things over the next few years. It's it's pretty interesting to me. Well, I'm hoping it takes things into a place that stuff actually gets done. People start playing games. Uh, That's the the secret sauce there, yeah. And plus the the sheer amount of resources I can now bring to bear compared to when I was a kid. Yeah. I can actually do this in many ways. It, it's it's that dream of having the like if I could have the free time that I had when I was twelve, and the you know the the petty budget that I've got now, if I could combine those two things, and you know I'm I'm much better organised these days as well. So what I could do with the time that I had, and you know the enthusiasm I had as a kid as well. Um, I like to think I've See, not lost. Some that, people but, would thrive. Yeah, some people definitely thrive. I wouldn't. I've found the constraints and the boundaries forces me to prioritize, mm. which forces me to get things done. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Uh, I like. I think back to pre, pre small child in the house. Like, what did oh, I that's do? Another life. What did that's I do life. all the time? <laughs> I I used to at some points think I'm quite busy, and I. It's nuts to think that <laughs> you were even... lying to yourself. Yeah, like. <laughs> how deluded I must have been and now it's like you know what you could do in 10 minutes you know when the kid goes down and I know I've got to do something in 10 minutes I could just quickly go and like splash some contrast on and you get a wee bit done and you know uh, aye God knows what I was like uh, before she came along but I often often think about it does absolutely I often think about my poor mother and father-in-law when I used to go back going, oh, I'm so tired today. And they would just smile and nod. And I thought, yeah. and now looking back on it, they, they, they must have just been laughing internally. Yeah. <laughs> you have no idea, child. Aye. <laughs> um, but no, from a hobby point of view, I, I, I've, in fact, in any point of view, I find that constraints actually somehow, in a weird way, get things done. That yeah. When you have no constraints, you can become boggled, go down side lanes, um, have no time constraint at all, so therefore you're not actually worried about making progress. It's 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 too chaotic. 
Um, hence why my teenage years have nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very good point on the constraints. Uh, I mean, you even think about uh, likening it to, to writing. A lot of people are terrified of the blank page and some writers, you know, if they're dipping their toes in writing, they'll, they'll maybe prefer to have certain prompts or parameters put on them, you know. Instead, okay. they just write a story. It's, okay, you're going to write this story, but this is the word count, and you're going to have a character who wants to do this, and this, you know, the, you've got to bring in this element as well. You've maybe got to set it somewhere. So um, it's a totally different thing, but it, it's that same idea of, like, these are your limitations, if you like, but in a weird way, it actually makes people get stuff done, so. Oh, without a doubt. Um, and that's why I like Dungeon Saga so much, because it's so constrained. Mm -hmm. That imagination seems to flow more from people because of it. Is it that D&D, for whatever reason, has left most people hollow, not knowing, a bit boggled, what are we doing here? It's too much, too freeform. The games master, you're leaning on them entirely to constrain it. And give you a focus and give you a, 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 a channel to travel. Um, whereas that's a lot of responsibility. You need someone very specific to do that role. Whereas this simple game is accessible to everyone because of its constraints, mm -hmm. because of its simplicity. And, and it's quite a universal um, principle in some ways is that constraints actually create, I've found. Um, and I love Dungeon Saga for that. And I'm looking forward to Dungeon Saga Origins too. To have a go. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, well, we've only got a, a few minutes left, but what I just wanted to oh, get no. your thoughts oh. on on that, like, what, uh, you know, what what do you know about this new one, and and what's your sort of hopes for it? My hopes is that I can shoehorn the rules into my old sets, and that I can um, introduce young and novice gamers of any age easier into the hobby with this new Dungeon Cyber Origins because it's a paired-back new game that doesn't link to the old rule set at all. It's replacing it. Um, well, I say at all. There are elements that you will understand and know, but they're, they're basically saying the new Dungeon Saga Origins is just just forget about the old game in some sense. This is the new one. You'll love it. And you can use your old minis in it. Um, and if you love the old one, you're going to love this one, and this is what we're going to build off from now on. Whether they do or not, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly going to be a great one for getting my kids in, and it's going to be a great one for getting newbies into the game. So because, is, so, is, is it aimed at, like, younger folk then, this one? Um, not merely younger, it's aimed at new folk. Right. So it's not just about the youngsters, it is just new mm. people to the hobby that are completely blank. Because I, I have found with introducing people into the game that even things that you and I would take trivially, and anyone that's even had a year's experience with gaming vaguely would take trivially, they find as a... Sometimes it's a stressor, but at minimum a sort of boggling thing. That um, So like free movement of miniatures completely throws people. Yeah. Squares, squares, move on squares. They're happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, and things like that. A Dungeon Saga Origins addresses all those points and tries to make it good for youngsters and for newbies of any age. Um, all from the box, like a board game, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a gateway drug. That's what I like. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about the new minis. They've inflated them to Kings of War um, um, size, and they're all very uh, dynamic. Whereas I told you last time that I, I would describe the Dungeon Saga miniatures as simple, and that's their strength. I yeah. love them for their simplicity. Um, so it's not my aesthetic, the miniatures, but the whole Kickstarter is so cheap that I can afford to bin them if I want to and get what I want from mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, I I like the the minis in the I, I painted up the full set of the Dungeon Saga. Uh, yeah, so I, I love them. So um, I it's a it's a great wee game, uh, and a good just a good even if you didn't play the game itself, just the kit, you know, the dungeon tiles, the miniatures, uh, the cards, and that you could create. You could use another rule set with it, and it would still work really well. I I, I people have. Um... Really criticised the previous Dungeon Saga, and there are there are some flaws with it, but I think it's thoroughly achieved its goals, mm. and it's so much of a sand pit that you can just use that kit for almost anything mm. if you want to, and it crosses over. That it's great, 
It's a thoroughly great game. And the holes, I think, with a little bit of imagination and diligence, you can get through the holes and the, pro- the problems with the thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's beyond the ken of man to get there. But yeah, no, thoroughly looking forward to Origins. Big thanks to Jason for coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure to chat with him. Uh, why not join our Discord community too? You'll find it at bedroombattlefields.com slash discord. It's a nice place to come and hang out to chat about old games, as well as swap pictures of your latest paint jobs and terrain projects. Once again, that's bedroombattlefields.com slash discord. Be great to see you in there. Alright, thanks very much for listening. Make sure you're subscribed or following on your listening app of choice, and we'll catch up again on the next episode. 